So welcome, and thank you for coming to Sun Tzu's Art of Code. My name is Kevin Byrne. I am a software developer here at Clearwater Analytics. And Sun Tzu was a Chinese general and philosopher from about 500 BC who taught some brilliant philosophies on how to win a war. Today, we're going to see how we as developers can improve by listening to his philosophies. So let's begin. This and other derivations of this quote are perhaps Sun Tzu's most famous in that he teaches the necessity of knowing yourself and knowing your enemy if you want to succeed. And this will be the crux of what I present today. As a developer, we might say the following. Know your customer and know your code hundreds of releases without fear. Not know code, but know the customer, win some, lose some. Not know customer and not know code, lose money every time. <laughs> now I put money in there somewhat loosely because we as developers wield massive power. Take into consideration in 1980, the height of the Cold War, on a Russian monitor, there showed a blip that indicated that a nuclear missile was heading toward Moscow. The Russian commander felt that that seemed odd. And protocol would have said to launch all the missiles and kill everything. He decided not to, and fortunately we're all still here. As it turns out, it was in fact a glitch in, the, in one of the Soviet satellites. Now, not every one of our software bugs could create World War III and the death of mankind, but a lot of money gets lost, a lot of opportunity, and lives can even be destroyed based on what we do with our code. A recent study suggested that as much as $3 trillion a year are lost because of insufficiently tested code. And as the wise Uncle Ben taught us, with great power comes great responsibility. So, how do we avoid losing money every time and ending the world? Sun Tzu instructed that to really know your enemy, you have to become your enemy. It is an act of hubris and arrogance to presume that just because we know a little bit about it, we know enough about it. So as developers, we might say, to know your code, you must test your code. And such testing needs to begin long before you wrote it. Sun Tzu was a planner. He felt that it was important to win the battle long before it was fought, and that such victory was made by the preparations, the works that you do ahead of time. So as a developer, we might say, the developer who wins the battle makes many assertions about the code before production. The developer who loses makes but few. Take as example, in 1998, the Mars Climate Orbiter, which gloriously blew up in the atmosphere of Mars. Why did it blow up? Well, they found as it was entering the, the orbit of Mars that it was a little bit off center and they needed to add a, a little bit more thrust to line things up. And as it turned out, one of the teams decided to calculate that using the metric Newton second unit and the other team used the English pounds force. They didn't really, they didn't check to make sure that they were both on the same page and as a result it got four and a half times more thrust than was needed, and the result was a $327 million fireworks show that nobody got to see. 
So why do we test? From the Agile Manifesto, we glean that we prefer working software over comprehensive documentation. And how do we know if it's working software? Because we have an automated test that proves it. Additionally, tests provide our definition of done. It lets us know when we've accomplished what we set out to do. So speaking of done, let's delve a little deeper into the goal of writing software. Sun Tzu was a master strategist and tactician, and he understood when to use each. Strategy is the what. What are we trying to accomplish? Whereas tactics are the how. How do we accomplish our strategy? So we as developers might say, knowing what without knowing how is the slowest route to victory. Knowing how without knowing what is the noise before defeat. It is possible to make a product that a customer wants to purchase without knowing how to code. It's going to be slow and miserable. But if, even if you know how to code really well, if you don't know what you're making, you'll never get there. So let's investigate strategy and tactics a bit more. Going with strategy being the what and tactics being the how, the what are the customer needs and wants. These are the things that, if satisfied, will sell the product. The tactics are how we get there. The tactics are code implementations and technologies. They, they're, they're how the, per, the particular way that we solve the problem at hand. Now, our strategy implies something critically important, and that it's that this battle is, in fact, worth fighting for. Or in other words, that this business is worth pursuing. If the customer needs are trivial, or wants are trivial, it may not merit the expense of designing software. Sun Tzu was a pragmatist. He understood that moving an army costs energy, it costs time, food, logistics, and the morale of the soldiers. Additionally, in software, nothing is done for free. It takes time. There's a, a level of burnout when you're developing. It costs to produce software. So we have to ensure that, first off, before anything else, is this a battle that we want to have? Is this something I want to invest into? Assuming it is, as a developer, we might say write code only if there is real advantage to be gained. So assuming we have a great war to fight, how can we develop sound strategy and tactics? This diagram shows a bit about how we might ensure that our strategy and our tactics are sound. The top half, and it, it helps us create a good strategy. In the top left blue of the, of the blue circle, you see, does it do what the customer needs? And the next one, does it do what the customer wants? If you can answer those two definitively, you have a sound strategy. Moving around the circle further, can the technology do what is required? And does the code do what the developer thinks it does? Those are critical components of a sound tactic. Are we using the right tool to solve this job? On the outside, you'll notice in the white squares that I've added a few example tests. And I want to make a note. Many of us have stumbled in the past on the nomenclature of testing. Is it a smoke test? Is it an integration test? Is it a system test, a unit test? I find those names to be inhibiting and confusing. I much prefer to see the tests as a tool to help us answer these four questions, because these are what really matter. Whether you have 100% unit test coverage is irrelevant if you can't say, I know that the code does what I think it does. 
So let's investigate each of these a bit more. Again, Sun Tzu understood the need to have a good strategy long before the battle. If we wait until after fighting the battle to determine whether we had a good reason to go to war, well, we probably failed already. So we might say as developers, thus it is that in development, the victorious coder only seeks to implement after the acceptance criteria is defined in tests. Whereas he who is destined to defeat first writes code and afterwards learns what the program should do. I recently read an article bemoaning how much software development time was wasted. And the author posited that most of the waste originated from developers solving the wrong problem. It wasn't an issue of capacity or aptitude. It was, are they solving the right problem? And this can be very hard. Many of us as developers aren't experts in the domain in which we work. Many here at Clearwater aren't accountants or have a financial nature, but we write accounting software. So it's not unreasonable to solve the wrong problem. So how do we ensure that we're solving the right problem? We would do it by answering the question, does it do what the customer needs? And this is a great place to start because these kinds of tests are often explicitly defined. Usually a customer knows, at a high level at least, what they're wanting. Do they want to check their email or do they want to change the temperature of their house? Do they want to look at their balance sheet or are they looking at Facebook? Which, what are they wanting to do? This is also, tests at this layer are the best documentation for actual functionality. What does it do? And especially in business terms, in customer terms. It's also the primary defense against a functional regression. In other words, you change the code and it no longer does what it used to need to do. So let's work on something, let's look at something a little bit more concrete. Here's a case study. The Acme Elementary School, they have a problem. To help students who are struggling with disciplinary infractions and for legal purposes, teachers and administrators at Acme Elementary School want a tool to help them track and coordinate infractions and corrective measures. So Tommy has a habit of getting in trouble at recess, but he's clever enough to do it only where different teachers see him each time. They want to make sure that they're on the same page and able to help Tommy, make sure that he's getting the feedback that he needs. So first thing, what are the needs that we can glean from this case? First, they, want a, or they need a single persistent place to track disciplinary infractions for the students. And it needs to include the student name, the teacher who reported, perhaps some notes. So what might a test of these needs look like? It's a little difficult to see, but the bolded no, um, words there, I really like this kind of a test definition when regarding a business-facing or a user-facing test. And it begins with, in order to, as a, I want to, whereas currently. The in order to tells us what we need to do. In this case, to help students who frequently struggle for, uh, with behavioral indiscretions by planning appropriate responses. As a teacher, I want to see all recent indiscretions by the student reported by all teachers. Whereas currently, I have to meet with each teacher to learn what's happened. The warehouse currently is unique to me because I often don't get that kind of scope as a developer. I don't know what their current solution might be unless it's existing code that I wrote. So it can be very helpful to know, well, what is their current situation? That also helps refine the, is this worth pursuing? Something to note here, in these needs, nowhere is it mentioned that they need software yet. In fact, Everything here can be accomplished with a pad of paper and pencil, which is a very meaningful thought. We need to ensure that software is in fact the right tool for the job. And at this point, there's nothing to guarantee that it is because software is expensive. Software requires maintenance, software requires training. It's rather heavy. Whereas handing them a piece of paper and a pencil and say, hey, write it down and put it where everyone can see it, that does solve their problem. 
Perhaps their once will shed some more light. Sun Tzu also recognized that in a campaign, it was necessary to maintain the morale of his soldiers. It is important for them to believe in the cause and to commit to it. So we as developers might say, he will win whose customer is excited to use the software. It is possible to have a good business model where you simply provide what no one else can. And in which case, they don't need to like it, they have to use it because they have no other option. However, that's an invitation for competition to swoop in, steal all your clients, and to leave you out in the cold. So we need to make something that not only works, but it needs to excite and delight the customer. So how do we accomplish this? By answering the question, does it do what the customer wants? This is a difficult area because a lot of the time, the customer's wants aren't explicitly defined. They want it to be a pleasant experience. Okay, well, what does that mean? Is it fast enough? Is it pretty enough? Is it convenient? Convenience is a huge one. Many times a market is won or lost because of convenience. This is an area where we as developers can glean a lot of information by using our software. I've often been guilty of having written software and never really used it, at least not in the context that our customers might. And so I don't feel the pain that they're feeling. I don't know how great it is. I just think, ooh, I made this cool thing. Check it out. So let's apply this to the case study. What are the wants? Well, the teachers, they want remote access. They want it to be easy to use. Let's assume they want it accessible from both their computer and their phone. So what might a test of this criteria look like? Following the, the same pattern as before, we might say, in order to more conveniently access student reports, as a teacher, I want to see indiscretion reports from my cell phone during lunch recess duty, whereas currently I can't see them at all. It is critical that we understand what their wants are in addition to their needs if we are to delight them. So with these wants, we kind of have an idea, okay, we've definitely made the case that it should be software. They want software at this point. What software do we use? Sun Tzu understood that there are some fights you simply cannot win. So don't fight those fights, fight a different fight. As coders, we might say, he who knows when he can do what the client wants and when he cannot will be victorious. Sometimes the wants of a client or of a customer don't line up with reality. And it is our opportunity as technology professionals to provide both the voice of reason as well as the voice of hope and excitement. No, I cannot crunch all possible numbers at the same time. I can't do that. There are such things as computational cycles and memory. But I can sure make it a more pleasant experience while you're waiting. Maybe it's a YouTube video that shows in the, in on the side or something. But we can do that. We can be both reason and hope. So let's dig into this. We need to ask, answer the question, can the technology do what is required? Can we actually do what the client wants? Again, this is often not explicitly defined and we as technology professionals have to be able to feed them. How many users are you wanting to be on this at the same time? If we're using an eventual consistency model, well, how soon is soon enough? Do you need to know right now? How critical is it that this never be wrong? Can it be wrong for a little while and then get better? Let's go to our, our case study and apply this question. So we need to be able to handle, let's assume 50 concurrently active users. We have about 50 teachers and administrators at Acme Elementary. They do want a persistence layer, something that has decent failover. They don't want to do all this work and then lose it if it powers down. 
They also want a pleasant user experience. And by the way, there is some angel investor who will provide a grant if you can do this using blockchain. So what do we do? How might a test in this regard look? Here I've written using a little bit of JavaScript, but hopefully this can port over to any language of your choice. This is my first example of using given when then, or what is also called Gherkin style testing. And I find it exceptionally helpful for writing readable tests. One of the greatest challenges we encounter when writing tests is if they're extremely coupled to a particular implementation, then the moment you change the implementation, the moment you refactor, the moment you change something about it, it shatters the test. And sometimes you can't even tell what it used to be testing. So it's healthy to have some layer where the tests are written based on behavior. Because these kinds of behaviors, the idea of having 50 concurrent users, and when they all request a user report and they all succeed, perhaps initially, the act of requesting a report is a simple HTTP request. However, down the road, we decide that we want to go to WebSockets. We're still having 50 people concurrently request a report, even though the underlying technology stack completely changed. So writing using this given when then style makes a very robust test. I love that song. <laughs> So this quote, while made famous in The Godfather, was in fact Sun Tzu, who taught the importance of keeping friends close and enemies closer. So we as developers might say, keep your coworkers close and your code closer. How do we keep our code close? We can answer this question. Does the code do what the developer thinks it does? This one is especially pertinent to us as developers. This is our primary defense against what we call technical debt. Many of us do as Mark Twain said when he, he wrote a, uh, a letter to a friend saying, I wanted to write you a short letter, but I didn't have time, so I wrote you a long one instead. Often that's exactly how our code starts out originally. It starts out as a, a beautiful mess. And we need to clean it up over time. We need to add new features. We need to give it a better cohesion. And this technical debt will happen no matter what. So our best defense against it is to have these unit tests. They allow us to churn through the technical debt faster. Additionally, this is how we ensure good code quality. No client will ever say, I want you to make sure you write the cleanest code possible, and I'll pay you extra to do it. That's not how it works. We as developers, again, with this great power we have, we have to be able to say, I wrote this so well that I am comfortable and confident that it does what I think it does. Granted, we have to be pragmatic. We can't know everything about it always but we at least need to take the time and put in the due diligence to ensure that we are covering the most important and, and vulnerable risks. So back to our case study. I have a class here called the entry service, which has a very simple API. You can add an entry. There's a little bit of logic here though. We're assuming that for a given student, there's, a, there's an option that they can send out an email or a text if this student gets in trouble. Perhaps the student's gotten in trouble a lot or is a high profile student. So we check if we should email based on the report and who's, what student it was. Let's make sure we send that email. So a test might look like this. Our first one says, given that we should email. When we add an entry, then should email is called once. We do check. We verify that every time an entry is sent, we do check that we, if we should email. 
We also check, given that should email is true, when we add an entry, it should send email. And if the last one, given should email is false, when add entry, then send email is not called. Again, using this given when then, it has helped introduce a layer of abstraction that gives, it gives form to what the class is intending to do, what the behavior is, while still leaving enough wiggle room that perhaps looking at the class over there, maybe we'll also add a should send Pony Express. We'll want to check that in the code, but we can still have these same tests be relevant. Or perhaps the act of checking if we should text decides to go to a database. We still have this high-level API and behavior that we're writing a test around. Sun Tzu also understood that war is all about change. That despite the very best plans made ahead of time, <clears throat> the best strategy and ideal tactics, when you're in the fray, things change. A surprise flank, perhaps the terrain wasn't what you expected, and you have to be able to adapt to that. We as developers might say the nature of code is constant change. I remember when I, when I first learned that I would spend most of my career working on legacy code, I was a little bit bummed. And so my, my first action would usually, when I check out a code base that was already there, I would open up the blame and see who was writing this horrible mess that I was having to fix. And it has uh, become enlightening over time as I keep finding my name more and more often as the person who wrote this horrible mess that I'm having to fix. But that is the nature of code. The moment we check it in, it became legacy. And chances are we will not remember what we had written in the past. But it is in maintaining high quality of legacy code that real business value is added. Very few wars worth fighting are won in a little skirmish. It's pretty rare that we can make millions of dollars or impact millions of people's lives for the better with a little two-line script. Chances are, if it was that simple, someone already did it. So most problems worth solving will require a healthy amount of legacy code. So coming to our case study, what are some changes that might have been introduced? The teachers, we gave them this beautiful product and they've been using it, but they're finding that the next thing they want to do is to be able to share this data with, the te with, with parents. But obviously, they don't want the parents to be able to change the data. So this implies that we're moving from 50 users, roughly, to possibly 4,000. And we introduced this concept of permissions, view versus edit. How do we handle this change? Coming back to this diagram, I've added where some of those questions might be injected. Under does it do what the customer needs, we might now ask, can parents view the data but not edit? Under does it do what the customer wants, does adding this cause any negative user experience changes? Did it suddenly slow down? Did it suddenly, did adding this new piece in the UI become ugly? Also, can the technology handle 4,000 concurrent users? And can the code be refactored to include view and edit permissions with confidence and in a timely manner? Each of those questions becomes noticeably easier to answer if we have the tests as our safety net. Going to the developer, think, does it do what the developer thinks it does? How many of us have had the joy of refactoring code that has unit tests. I, it's amazing. It's a glorious experience. Most of us, though, have had the opposite experience of having to refactor something that has no tests. 
and you may or may not know what it actually does. And there may or may not be comments in the code that are probably out of date. If you can answer yes to all four of these questions, you have won the war. Sun Tzu understood that victory comes from finding opportunities in problems. We as developers have a magnificent opportunity to change people's lives for the better. We have amazingly powerful tools at our disposal. What we do can shape the world in many ways. It can shape the world for an individual or for an entire society. We have great power and great opportunity. And so my call to all of us today is to learn from Sun Tzu, to know your customer and know your code, and then you will win the war. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So for the given when then um, style of testing, is that a layer of abstraction that you put inside of your text, so you're writing that layer in your, in your unit testing framework, or is that a layer that exists inside of your actual so the question was whether we use the Gherkin style given when then in the test framework or in the code itself, in the, in the, in the unit tests itself? Right, the motivation for the question being, you mentioned that this saves you from having to refactor your unit test later, but if the underlying implementation changes, don't you just have to change that layer now? So the suggestion was, didn't we introduce another layer that has to be changed if we change the implementation? And Yes, however, a recent experience I had on one of our teams is we needed to do a refactor. And we really didn't know what the thing was doing. It worked in production, and it was making us money, but it was actually really hard to know what exactly it was doing. The code wasn't exceptionally readable. The, the primary benefit I find from these Gherkin-style tests is that they explicitly define the behavior which you can then use as a reference guide of, OK, well, what is this supposed to do? Yes, you'll still have to implement that glue code, the, the code that takes the Gherkin style, more readable format, and turns it into an actual implementation under the scene. But in the future, when that implementation changed or was moved, you can come back to those tests and say, well, what was it doing? Why was it, what was it doing it for? And should it still be doing that? You can ask the question of, is this still a meaningful assertion? It might be that they're not. The business needs do change occasionally, in which case you do change the Gherkin style tests, but it provides a very healthy injection of context directly into the tests. Any other questions? Go ahead. Do you have any tips for putting off yourself as a developer and putting on the persona of a client to be able to evaluate your project from a third direction? That's an excellent question. The question was, do I have any advice for how to take off the persona of developer and try to put on the persona of the customer or the, the client? And that's hard. I would say, in my experience, the best thing is to see your customer. So when in my case, I try to go talk, chat with CS. I want to see who's using this. I want to feel their pain so that I can appreciate what I'm trying to solve. At its core, software development is about people. We have to engage people to really know if we're solving people's problems. Thank you, that was a good question. Any other questions? All righty, thank you again. <laughs>